This summer, we're spending a couple weeks in the book of Psalms, um, meditating on some Psalms that are very familiar to us, meditating on some Psalms that might not be familiar to us, but um, words that are uplifting, encouraging. And we've um, normally, if you're here, you know that we go through books of the Bible, and we will spend uh, quite a bit of time going through a book of the Bible. We're halfway through the book of Hebrews, and we've been in Hebrews for most of the year, and um, so come September, we'll dive back into the book of Hebrews and finish it up. But these Psalms are meant to encourage us, so we don't dive deep into it, but they're meant to lift us up and challenge us in our faith. A lot of what we speak over these ne- several weeks are things that you guys know, things that you are familiar with. It's not something new, something profound. It's, it's just an encouragement to remind you that God is with you, that God is faithful, that God is good. So um, as we dive into this, would you pray that God, would you speak to me? Passages like this one that we're all familiar with, many of us probably know it by memory. Um, it's very easy for us to tune out um, and say, oh, I'm, I know what this passage is about, but would you pray that God, would you speak to me? This is probably the most famous passage in all of Scripture. It's the John 3:16 of the Old Testament. Young people know it. Old people know it. People that have been Christians a long time have it memorized. New Christians, there are folks that are even non-religious, they know it. It's memorized by children, recited at weddings, read at sickbeds, preached at funerals, and consulted in counseling. The words of this song have been used in classical music, rock music, R&B, country and rap, and probably many other types of music. Without a doubt, this is one of the greatest poems that have ever been written. It's known around the world and it's been appreciated throughout the ages. But it's not a song that everyone can sing. It's not a song for everyone. This is a song that's an exclusive testimony of people that have a personal relationship with Jesus. The only thing that we know about this psalm is that it's a psalm that's been written by David. We don't know whether David composed this when he was a little boy shepherding the sheep. We don't know if he was writing this when he was in the palace reflecting on his life. We don't know if he wrote it during a time of peace or if he wrote it when he was Um, running away from his enemies. But just because we don't know the historical context of this psalm does not mean that it hinders our ability to understand what David is saying in this psalm. It actually helps us to relate to it in a more personal way. Whatever David's personal circumstances were, whatever his situation was, he was able to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This morning, the question that needs to be asked this morning is, God, your shepherd, Is he your provider? Can you, with the psalmist, declare that the Lord is my shepherd? See, if you're a believer in this room, you can't read this psalm without reflecting that this is speaking about Jesus. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. In John, in Hebrews 13, Jesus is called the great shepherd. In 1 Peter 5, 4, they call him the chief shepherd. But this morning, is he your shepherd? The great preacher Charles Spurgeon said, if he's, a sh- if he's not a shepherd to anyone else, he's a shepherd to me. He cares for me. He watches over me. He preserves me. He is my shepherd. Can you say that? Can you say this morning that it is God that watches over you? And through this song this morning, I want to remind you and encourage you that God watches over you, God walks with you, and God welcomes you. Those are the three things I want to remind you of. God is watching over your life. God is walking with you, and God is um, welcoming you. A young boy was reciting Psalm 23 in in his church one day, and he was trying to say it from memory, and he got on stage and forgot the words. And so he made it up, and he said, The Lord is my shepherd, so I won't worry about anything else. He didn't get the words right, but he got the meaning right exactly. If God is my shepherd, I've got nothing else to worry about. There are only two options in life, guys. If God is your shepherd, then you don't worry. However, if you're worrying, it's because God is not your shepherd. If there's emptiness and loneliness and dissatisfaction and frustration in your life, it's because God's not your shepherd. If you look to anyone or anything else to fulfill your needs and find joy and satisfaction, he will never, you will never be satisfied. There's nothing, there's no one in this life that can bring you true satisfaction. If you trust God, you can live with confidence that God is watching over you. 
Verse 2 says that he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Notice what he says. First, he says that God will provide nourishment for us. Sheep are not able to hunt food for themselves. They're not able to dig up their own food. They need someone to lead them to the right place. And it's got to be green pastures because sheep have a tendency to eat the wrong stuff. They eat the things that will mess them up. So a good shepherd will satisfy their sheep's hunger by leading them to the right place. He will lead them to a pasture that's full of grass. And when he gets there, what does he do? He makes them lie down. He says, you've got a long journey in front of you. You've got to go through different valleys and cliffs, so you need to rest and make sure you're okay. He knows that sheep are tired. He knows that sheep are hungry. And tired and hungry sheep will be difficult to manage. So he makes them lie down. This is how God works in our lives. He provides for our physical needs. The reason that you are healthy this morning is not because you were smart enough. It's because God took care of you. The reason you were able to wake up this morning out of bed after a good night rest is because God gave you that rest. God provides for your physical needs. But not only does God provide nourishment, he also provides refreshment. Once the sheep have satisfied their hunger and rested, they also need something to drink. So the shepherd leads them beside still waters. And just like the pasture needs to be green, the waters need to be still because sheep if they fall into running waters, they don't know how to get themselves back up. They'll drown. So a shepherd will, take, um, will create a dam and make sure the water is calm so that the sheep can go in and drink without toppling over and floating away and dying. This is how God watches over our physical needs. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. But God does more than just take care of our physical needs. He, verse 3, he says, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. In this verse, David reminds us that God will take care of our spiritual needs as well. But how does he do that? The first thing he does is he provides restoration for us when we stray away. In the first two verses, David describes about how good the shepherd is. The shepherd makes sure I have food. The shepherd makes sure I rest. The shepherd makes sure I have drink. Um, he takes care of my physical needs. But there are times when I wander away. There are times where I leave the shepherd. But this isn't a negative uh, reflection on the shepherd. The shepherd is good all of the time. But even though the shepherd is good, we're still sheep. And so there are times when the sheep will look for satisfaction and nourishment in empty and barren places. And there are times when sheep will look for refreshment in polluted waters. The prophet Isaiah reminds us that all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each of us to our own ways. We have tried to find satisfaction and joy and contentment and peace and happiness in places other than God. We've wandered away, but the shepherd brings us right back. He restores our soul. And that is our testimony. If you're here this morning, you know there are times where you wandered away from God, trying to find joy in money or satisfaction in your job or in a relationship or anywhere else, and you realize that no one could satisfy you the way that Jesus satisfies you. He restores your soul. He leaves 99 other sheep to pursue the one that wanders away. He, and he says, the, Isaiah says, he lays our iniquity upon the shepherd upon Jesus. Not only does he restore us when we stray, but he also guides us to keep us from straying. Isn't that encouraging? That he doesn't just go rescue us every time we mess up, but he also gives us wisdom and guidance so that we don't keep going in the wrong direction. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. There are three promises right there. Number one, it reminds us that God will faithfully lead us if we trust him. The second promise is that he will lead, uh, lead us in paths of righteousness. The way that God will lead us is the right way. You don't have to worry about if God knows where he's going. He does. He knows exactly where he's leading. And if he is God, you can trust him with your life. God will lead you in paths of righteousness. And the third promise there is the greatest promise. He does this for his name's sake. His reputation is on the line. His identity is on the line. His name is on the line. He does this because his reputation is there. Philip Keller is a shepherd. He wrote a book called A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23. And in this book, Keller talks about how shepherds raise sheep for their wool. 
There's, this is where their profit was. So he would take the sheep to the market for them to um, sell their coats of wool. But the shepherd would choose the path very carefully. If he showed up with sheep that were wounded or injured, it would hurt his profit margin. So he would lead his sheep in straight paths to the, straight to the marketplace. The merchants would examine the sheep as best as they could, but they'd come to a point where they couldn't examine anymore. However, at that point, they would accept the sheep on the reputation of the shepherd for his name's sake. This is how God leads. In paths of righteousness for his name's sake. His reputation is at stake. His word is on the line. His name is on the table. He leads you. Because, he can't, he, because his name is on the line. The wife of Albert Einstein once asked if, was once asked if she understood her husband's theory of relativity. She said, I have no idea what he's talking about. But I know my husband. If he, knows it's, if he says it's true, you can trust him. See, that's our testimony this morning. We might not understand the direction God leads us, we might not understand why God does what he does, but we know him. He is faithful. He is good. All things work together for good to them that love him, that are called according to his purpose. We know him. His reputation is on the line. We know he will take care of his sheep. The first three verses there declare that God is worthy of our trust because he is good, he is faithful, and he's sufficient. But when you get to verse 4, David is no longer in the green pastures by the still waters. He's not at a place of peace and tranquility. He's now in a deep valley. But his confidence in God doesn't change just because his circumstances have changed. Verse 4, verse four says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. There's bad news in this verse. There's also good news in this verse. The bad news, just because you trust God, doesn't mean that you're not going to experience trouble and hardship in your life. When his son died of a rare aging disease, Harold Kushner wrote the best-selling book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Unfortunately, Kushner gave the wrong answer to a very important question. In fact, the question itself is misleading. It implies that good people, whoever they are, should, should be void of trouble in their lives. But that's just not true. Job 5, 7 that says that man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Did you get that? Bad things don't just happen to bad people. They happen to all people. Listen carefully. There's only one person in this world that lived without sin, Jesus. He was the only one we could say was good. But there is no one in this world that didn't suffer, including Jesus. Bad things happen to all people. David admits that there are times that he has to go through the valley. But this isn't an indictment against the shepherd again. David isn't saying that he's in the valley because he strayed away from the shepherd either. David is seeing, saying that there are times that the righteous ways of God require that he will lead you through valleys that require that you would have to go through places that it seems like shadows of death. The imagery here is of a dark place where you can't see anything. It's a valley so dark, so deep, that the shadow has hidden the sunlight. The phrase can apply to death itself, but it also can apply to any dark situation that we face in life. Sometimes sickness can be the valley of the shadow of death. A broken heart can be the valley of the shadow of death. Divorce can be the valley of the shadow of death. An unmet need or circumstance in your life can be the valley of the shadow of death. Unemployment can be the valley of the shadow of death. A death of a loved one can be the valley of the shadow of death. The loss of your reputation or your job or your career can be the valley of the shadow of death. Let me say again, just because you trust in God doesn't mean that God will keep you from going through the valley of the shadow of death. But remember, it's only a shadow. The shadow of a dog cannot bite. 
The shadow of a sword cannot kill you, and the shadow of death cannot harm a child of God. It's only a shadow. So while there may be times that you've got to go through the valleys of the shadow of death, there's also very good news in this verse that because you go through the valley doesn't mean you go through it alone. There is a God that's with you every step of the way. David doesn't have to control over what's going on in his life. The shepherd has led him into the valley, but David knew he had control over how he responded when things were rough. He chose not to be afraid of the evil, the danger, and the threatening things that were meeting him in the valley because David was not going through the valley alone. So if you are trusting God this morning, realize that he is with you every step of the way. He is with you. David says he isn't afraid because the shepherd was with him. Listen, if you're sitting here this morning after going through trials and hardships and pain and suffering, you could be up here testifying that God was with you every step of the way. All of us could say that, that when you went through the hardest, most difficult times of your life, that there was a God that had never abandoned you, that had never forsaken you, that was with you every moment. You were never walking alone. He was with you. The psalmist declares, I've set the Lord before me because he is my right hand. I will not be shaken. Psalms 46 says that God is my refuge and my strength, a very present help in trouble. Isaiah 41 says, fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my right hand. God is with you this morning. Not only is God with you, but he's also ready to help you. I don't know about you, but the, the times in my life where I've sensed the presence of God, the strongest in my life was those times when I felt like I was going through a valley. Sadly, many people think that God leaves when trials and hardships and difficulties come. But a believer finds that God draws near when life begins to fall apart. David says that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not have to fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod, the staff are basic components, basic equipment to protect the sheep. His rod is a club in one hand. His staff is a long stick is in his other hand. In other words, the shepherd never travels unprepared. He's always ready to protect you. He's always ready to watch over you. David says, my comfort is this. When I'm going through the valley of the shadow of death, when I'm going through hardships in my life, I know that everything is going to be okay because the shepherd has everything that I need to protect me. Go to verse 5. In the first four verses, David describes God as a good shepherd. But in the last two verses, the scene completely shifts. Now, you're at a party, and God is preparing a table before you. In these last two verses, God is described as a gracious host who is ready to celebrate with you. In verse 5, the setting changes. We're no longer sheep. We're not in the valley anymore. Instead, we're now guests in God's house. These last two verses remind us that God's hospitality is generous, and God's hospitality never stops. God's hospitality is generous. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. You, my, cluff, my cup overflows. David says there are three ways that you can tell that God is incredibly generous to his people. He says, look at my enemies. David sees himself as a guest in the house of a king. The host has prepared a huge feast, and David is the guest of honor. But some of David's enemies are there as well. So David has a decision to make. Will he flee the presence of his enemies, or will he enjoy the feast that has been set before him? David chooses to enjoy the hospitality of the king in spite the fact that his enemies were there. See, the custom of that day required that the host would take personal responsibility for his guest. So literally, David's enemies that were there weren't just his enemies. They were the enemies of the host. They were now God's enemies. So David was able to enjoy the meal even though his enemies were sitting there right before him because he was confident that the host would watch over him. David says, look at my enemies. The second thing he says is, look at my head. See, in our day, if a guest comes over, the common courtesy is to take his coat and to offer them a drink. But in the ancient Near East, the custom was to wash, your, 
wash your guests' feet from dust and dirt of the roads and to anoint their heads with a fragrant oil. The washing of the feet was a basic hygienic courtesy, but the anointing of the head with oil was an extravagant act of kindness and hospitality to express how glad and excited he was to have a guest in the house the host would have his servant take oil and anoint them with anoint their head with oil but notice what he says it's not a servant anointing me you anoint my head with oil God is so excited about you God loves you so much that when you are in his presence God himself anoints you with oil and the third thing he says it says, look at, my cup. look at my cup. The word cup is often used in Scripture allegorically to describe one's circumstances in life. Remember, Jesus, used to, Jesus prayed in the garden. He said, God, if you would, take me. The cup refers to the circumstances that we go through in life. Again, we see a picture of God's extravagant generosity. If the Lord gave what David deserved, David's cup would be filled with wrath, judgment, and condemnation. But God takes away from David's cup what he deserved. And he doesn't just leave it empty. He pours into the cup his blessing and goodness and mercy and compassion and favor. And he doesn't just fill the cup halfway. He fills it to the brim. And after the cup was full, he keeps pouring in his blessing so that the cup begins to overflow. See, the psalm is a great comfort for people during times of hardship and during time of grief. But it's unfortunate that many people only think about it at funerals. The focus on the psalm is, that, that is on what Jesus does throughout our lives. He is constantly blessing us. He is constantly providing for us. He is constantly taking care of us. Our hope is not that one day everything's going to be okay. Our hope is that in the midst of whatever we're going through, it will be okay because God is with us. He is faithful to us. The final verse, verse 6, closes this song by declaring God's faithfulness through every day and throughout eternity. You can count on God every day of your life. There are a few things in life that you can count on. Your health might fail you. Your money might run out. Your loved ones might disappoint you. But you can count on God. Verse 6 declares that surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all of the days of your life. Goodness and mercy are the twin attributes of God that follow God's children everywhere that they go. You need goodness and you need mercy. You need them both. You need goodness because goodness makes sure that you reach your destination. You need mercy because when you fall along the way, mercy comes along and picks you up and says, keep going. You need goodness to make sure you reach where you're going. You need mercy to make sure that when you slip, God is right there to pick you up. You need goodness and mercy. And God says, goodness and mercy shall follow you all of the days of your life. You're not in it alone. Not only can you God count on God's faithfulness in this life, you can also count on God's faithfulness beyond this life. You can count on God for all eternity. The last verse, part of verse 6 declares, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The closing statement of this beautiful psalm reminds us that when God embraces you, when God chooses to love you, nothing can stop him from loving you. What can separate us from the love of God? Can sickness or death or angels or demons, nothing can separate us. He is faithful to you even when you're unfaithful. In fact, he is faithful all the way to the end. There's a man by the name of George Madison who was partially blind his entire life. When he was about 18 or 19, he lost complete sight in both of his eyes. Life went on, but it was hard. He continued to his theological studies and eventually actually pastored a church. He was never married. He was engaged when he was younger, but when he lost his sight, his fiancée left him and broke off the engagement. And that painful experience was the inspiration that led him to write the hymn, O oh, love that will never let me go, I rest my soul in you. I give you back the life I owe, so that in thy ocean depth its flows may richer and fuller be. Listen, if God's love will never let you go, you can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
I heard a story this week of two shepherds, a good shepherd and a bad shepherd. Their, sh their land were right next to each other. The good shepherd had good, healthy, vibrant sheep. The bad shepherd had sick, weak, and dying sheep. One day, one of those weak sheep got to the edge of the fence that divided these two land, the property, and he fell over. And he was weak and he was dying. And all of the strong sheep on the other side came over and began to mock him, began to make fun of him. And eventually the strongest of the sheep came by and looked down. And the weak sheep looked up and said, go ahead. Why don't you join the others and make fun of me? Why don't you mock me as well? But the strong sheep said, I will not. Because if it wasn't for my shepherd, I would be in the same place where you are at. If it wasn't for my shepherd, I would be in the same place where you're at. This morning, isn't that your testimony? It's not that you were blessed because you were better than everyone else. It's not that you're sitting here alive because you deserve it. But you recognize that if it wasn't for a good shepherd, if it wasn't for the loving hand of God, if it wasn't for his tender mercies and his care, the only reason we're here is because we have a great shepherd. Jesus in John 10 says, I am a good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The greatest need that we ever had wasn't our physical needs, wasn't um, drink or nourishment. The greatest need we ever had was that we were sinners dying, going to hell. And when we could not find a way out, when we could not earn our salvation, when we could not earn righteousness with God, the shepherd comes down, lays his, down, lays his life down for the sheep, gives his life so that you can experience the presence, the blessings, the provisions, the mercy, the goodness, the grace, the love of Jesus. I know what I said this morning isn't deep. But this morning, if you're here this morning and your worship is stagnant, can I remind you that you have a great shepherd? If this morning you're sitting here and you're worried about the details of your life and worried about how you're going to make it through this week, can I remind you you have a good shepherd? If you're worried about your health, can I remind you you have a good shepherd? If you're worried about your finances, can I remind you, you have a good shepherd. Listen, if you're here this morning and you're worried about eternity, can I remind you there's a good shepherd that is ready to welcome you into his flock. We serve a great shepherd. In a few moments, we're about to come to the table to celebrate the greatest event that has ever happened in the history of humanity the perfect, sinless, blameless Lamb of God who deserved everything good but received the worst so that we who deserve everything bad could receive everything good. As you examine your hearts, as you examine your life, would you see if there's anything in you that's not like Jesus? Your attitudes, your actions, your affections. Maybe you're here worried this morning about life. And would the psalmist remind you that he leads you, he guides you, he provides for you. And as you examine your heart, I'm going to invite you, whenever you're ready, you can come to the table, grab the elements, and come back to your seat as the worship team sings, and I'll come up here in a few moments, and we'll partake of the table together. Father, this morning, thank you that you're our shepherd. Many times we feel like we're trying to figure our life out, we're trying to figure the road out, but you're with us. You're the one who's leading, you're the one who's guiding. 
we can walk in confidence because you are with us. You take care of our physical needs. You take care of our spiritual needs. You're with us when life is rough. And you've got an incredible party planned for us. A feast. Thank you that you are faithful. We love you. In Jesus' name.